Welcome, guys. Uh, we here tonight. We're talking 1995. Uh, the famous Battle of Butte Erasmus, uh, the, the Canada-South Africa game. 25 years on, to be lucky enough to have two of the players here with Gavin and I tonight. We've got Henny LaRue, who was on, on the bench and part of that 95 World Cup winning team, and Christian Stewart, who played for Canada that night. So welcome, guys. Thanks, Brendan. Nice to be here. <laughs> I think let's start with Henny. Kevin, <laughs> sorry, but uh, let's start with Henny. Uh, Henny, I mean, you guys came into that game... Um, off the back of that game against Australia, the, 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 the euphoria of beating Australia and, and then maybe a bit of a dip against Romania in that. But just maybe take us through what was the feelings in the camp coming through into that game against Canada? Yeah, I think to a large degree, you know, we weren't very happy with the result against Romania. There was no real continuity in the game. There was no flow. Uh, so I think everyone expected a lot more. Uh, Romania did make it difficult for us. Uh, you know, they went full out defense mode, but we also didn't, you know, really do what we were meant to do. And that's just control the game up, up front and, and, and get ball on the front foot. It was more of a chomel, as they call it. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of grinded on and grinded on and we never really got anything going. So it was a frustrating game all in all. And, you know, we needed to, to, to get back to game plan against, against Canada. If, if I remember right, though, there was, there was a bit of niggle in the lead up to that. There was a couple of words said in sort of the media conferences and that. Did you guys pick up on that coming into the game? Are uh, you talking about prior to the Canada game? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, there wasn't really too much, uh, you know, that, that we as players, you know, felt, um, you know, Canada was always a very physical type of side. And uh, it was, again, one of those aspects of, of, of trying to dominate uh, with structure and plan and pattern play more than letting it kind of unravel. Uh, because, uh, you know, they they were very committed as a side. Uh, but collectively, I think just because of years of, of playing, you know, if we struck to structure and pattern and plan, you know, the odds were that, that, that we should have uh, possibly beaten them. Christian might disagree, but yeah, that's... Uh, not at all. Fully in agreement. Well, there was Chris a game... That I was going to say, let's it was a Chris. game that South Africa just needed to to get through, get the get the the W, and uh, move on. You know, for 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 the Canadians, it was a uh, you know it was you know one of the great days in their sporting careers to to have the opportunity to play against South Africa in South Africa. So for you guys, it was almost like you're going into a final. I mean, in yeah, the sense that was, there wasn't there wasn't no tomorrow. I mean, it was like you it know, no it didn't matter. absolutely. It you didn't have to worry about being injured where the box did no. because we've seen a couple of World Cup games since then. We were in, myself and Brennan were in, in um, I think it was North Auckland in 2011 when the box played against Samoa and it was a similar scenario and you can imagine playing Samoa when they've got absolutely nothing to lose and for them it's the final and the box obviously were looking forward to a quarter final against Australia and uh, it is one of the problems of the World Cup, isn't it? I mean, in the sense that the, 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 at the, right at the end of the full pool phase, you have guys, you have teams playing against each other that don't have the same thing that they're playing for, if you know what I'm saying. No, 100%. Yeah, no, that was very much the case. So, you know, I, I, I will say this, that in, in the lead up to the game, I wasn't aware of any press, uh, that there was any niggled in, in, in the media. But, you know, as teams do, they study other teams and they watch the videos of the previous performances and the only thing that I can say going into that game was that Canada were very aware that South Africa was a very physical side. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, physical sides and historically South Africa have, you know, pushed, pushed the boundary as all physical teams do. And, uh, and I think there was just a kind of general feeling that, you know, we're not going to allow ourselves to be bullied. And that yeah. was, but there was nothing more to it than that. And I think that, I think what ha happened on the night was just, to, you know, it was just kind of a random event for some reason. Maybe it was because the lights had gone out and, you know, there was something in the air that night. But there was no, there was certainly no intent or no intention from Canada's side um, to get involved in, 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 in what, um, 
in what eventually took place. You, you nearly, you nearly never played for Canada that night. You nearly actually played for the Springboks. I, I know I read somewhere last year, or I heard somewhere last year, you said that Kitch had actually intended to field you alongside Henny. Henny was going to play flower half. You were going to play number twelve in that game about a month before the World Cup at Ellis Park against Samoa. Am I am I right in saying that? Gavin, so yeah, so Henny might not be, even be aware of this. Um, so in that game, I was informed by Edward Griffiths that I'd been selected at 12 and Henny was at 10 and Yarpi was at 13. And as was done in those days, and I don't know how it's done today, the team would go to the IRB and the IRB would have to sanction the side. And Edward Griffiths phoned me a day later to say, you've been banned for three years. So I had no intention of playing for Canada in the 95 World Cup. Um, I'd played for Italy, uh, sorry, I'd played in Italy for Revigo the, the season before, that December, January, uh, I came back in about January. With AJ and Fenton. Canada had come on tour to Europe and had got hold of me and said, just hop on the tour. And, you know, um, interestingly, they had introduced a ban that year or the law that year that you stood down for three years if you played for another country. And it was intended to stop the Islanders from playing New Zealand. So um, nobody was aware that there was this three-year ban in place. Hey, Henny, did you, did you know about that, Henny? Did you? No, I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't, frankly. But yeah, these rules get made to, uh, you know, favour and please the powers that be. So <laughs> no, I wasn't aware of that, but it could very really well be. Any, do you remember the, 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 the build-up to the one thing I do remember, and Christian, you can also comment as well. The one thing I do remember, because I was in PE that week, was that, and I mean, you're an Eastern Cape guy yourself, is that, if I remember correctly, and Chris, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, you guys were based in PE the whole, the whole tournament, well, the whole time that you were there. And, yes. the, the, and the PE people sort of, like they do, sort of uh, adopted you as their own. And it was almost like a, a bit of a sort of almost like a derby. There, there was. I remember the East, Eastern Province Herald was was huge about Canada because you'd been there the whole time, and it was almost yeah. like you got into 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 the game as the sort of like the the, the, the home team. Yeah, I think um, I think we'd been we'd been good for business. We kept the pubs full, <laughs> and um, yeah, I think yeah, I think you you're probably right. There was an element that we were their their kind of home team. Do you remember that aspect, Henny? I mean, you guys weren't there the whole time, so you wouldn't know. Maybe you, you, you arrived. What the, the, the Romanian game was only about four days before, so you were only in PE for about three days, I suppose. Yeah. Look, I, I, I can't say I really picked up on that, but uh, other than knowing that Canada, you know, was, was based there, um, you know, it, it wasn't something that, that really came to the fore while we were there. Uh, just but, oh, either of you, I mean, let's start with Henny, mate. Coming into the, when the game started, uh, uh, we had the delay, the, the load shedding, which we didn't call load shedding back then, but the floodlights that failed in 45 minutes of darkness. Maybe uh, both of you just chat about the feelings in the change room going into that. Um, it turned out to be the first of, 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 not the first delay for the Springboks in that tournament with the, with the semi-final one as well. But just maybe Henny, first from you, just what was it like in that change room with the 45 minutes not knowing if you're going to play. And then, Christian, you maybe you're coming in there. Yeah, Brendan, you know, it, it, it is a little difficult because you try and build yourself up to the time that you go out. And, uh, you know, it's, it's there's two aspects to it. Obviously, there's the mental preparation and then there's a the physical preparation of warming up and, and getting to the point where you you warm enough to go on and you've stretched every muscle and uh, and so forth. So it, it is a little bit disrupting in terms of your normal cycle and of, of, of your, your normal process. But, um, yeah, so to get logged back another 45 minutes and then be uncertain whether it's going to happen or not and where the problem lies, and uh, it, it, it was a little bit unnerving. And, and uh, you know, for us, we also used to playing during the day mostly, you know. Uh, so it, it, it wasn't... It, it wasn't uh, an ideal start for, for us at all. Christian, you, Chris, you guys? From your from yeah, the Canadian... I, I, I'd, I'd agree with, with Henny. I mean, it must have been bloody painful. I mean, they just wanted to, you know, to, as I said earlier, to get the win under their belt and move on as quickly as possible. And um, 
it was it was strange that night. I remember, interestingly enough, that I had had a a, a big night. Uh, in those days, it was very amateur the game. <laughs> I think we conducted ourselves differently. I don't know. Maybe things have changed. And I remember going out and bumping into David Campisi and Jason Little, and I ended up uh, having drinks with them all night. I need to realise that uh, they had been rested for the for the for the coming days. And um, I remember thinking to myself and joking afterwards that it, that extra 40 minutes had allowed me a little bit more recovery time. So the, 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 I, I, it, it definitely galvanized the Canadians, funnily enough, when the lights went off. I think when we first went out, I seemed to think that, we was, that the Canadians were so nervous and overawed by playing South Africa in South Africa that, you know, this opportunity to come back in to the change room and it, it was unique and it was different and I think it galvanized the guys and there was something you know that that uh, as I said there was something in, in the in the in the air it certainly I think played into our hands and uh, definitely didn't play into the South African hands okay. I think and, and he, I think I think um, I think from the game plan I think it was quite obvious that um, you guys wanted to keep it tight I mean you you were obviously so dominant in the scrums and we were you know going to try and move the ball around and try anything and um, you were always going to, you know, the, the, the result was never in doubt. And uh, South Africa just had to stick to the basics and put points on the board and get through the game. Any bad uh, catch in that game? Remember, I, I can't remember whether the gold team was the first choice team or the, or the green team was the, the first choice team. But he had that, that, that twin team policy. And when he went into that game, I was always a bit concerned. I know he chose Francois as the captain. But like his mixing and matching against against Romania was okay, but Canada were a much stronger team in those days than they are now. I mean, I think Canada Canadian rugby's regressed quite a bit since since those days. And I remember being quite concerned because if you'd lost that game, I mean, it wasn't really realistic. But Christian will will probably vouch for the fact that in 1999, sorry, in the 1991 World Cup, Canada actually did quite well, and I think they pushed some of the big teams quite. Quite well. I mean, you played in that World Cup, didn't you, Chris? We made the quarterfinal. We, we lost. Yeah, I think we played the quarterfinal. Exactly. So you'd so you gone quite a long way. So you'd yeah. gone quite a long way in the previous in the previous World Cup. I was I was very nervous. Were you guys sort of fully on board with the with the whole sort of team selection that night? And that like we're going to go in there with it wasn't a second string team because Francois was leading it, but it was largely a sort of mix and match team. I mean, you were on the yeah, it was. I think I think it was very much a rotational policy that that he did want to follow. He did want to give the guys a bit of a break, uh, and that was the, the the game to do it. Um, you know, if they played in the first, initial two games, you were either benched or not playing. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think Francois played against Romania. So well, he, uh, Richter, Richter captain you then, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and uh, so everyone kind of had had their break as part of our, our, our part of the process, and that was possibly you know showing that he did uh, view view Canada as a bit of a threat, and that you know Francois' presence as captain was required in that particular game. So uh, I mean that that would warrant that, but but the rest of the selection was a bit of a changeover. There were some there were definitely some uh, um, let's call it, you know, guys rested and, and other, uh, other, other parties put in, in their place. But they would have added to the tension because, as Chris says, everybody expected you to win. You're expected to go through to the quarterfinals. And yet, being the favourites in a game like that sometimes is, 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 is not the greatest position to be in. No, it's not. And, and, and you know, you, you also kind of develop momentum with the players around you. And, and when you start changing the team with four, five, six, seven players, there's just some aspect which, which goes missing. And um, I think in, in, in that environment, we kind of had that. And, and Canada came out with a very physical approach. So it, it does kind of disrupt the momentum and... And the unity within the team because you're kind of uncertain. You're used to other people next to you, how they run, what lines they are, uh, you know, where to expect them, you know, what the communication is. So there's nothing like playing together to, to form 
to formulate and, and, and get that cohesiveness. And I think to some degree that was missing. And I think, you know, Canada further exploited that by, by coming on onto the field with a, with a real physical approach and, uh, you know, had us on, on the back foot for, for quite some time. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, I mean, I, if I remember from the game, there was a number of sort of off-the-ball incidents, so that, um, little pushes after a tackle. And I remember one with, 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 I think it was the eighth man in Canada, who sort of put his elbow into Yurst's face across the touchline there. And Yurst turned around and said to him, do you want to come? Come. And he like, he was, he was egging him on. So there, it was building up like that. I mean, you were sitting on the sideline at that stage. And then obviously later on came on. You guys had built up a 20-0 lead by then. Um, did you guys sense that it might break loose? I mean, you, at, at any point? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, sitting on the stand, I, I, I particularly knew of at least two or three incidents where, where, where there was big niggle, you know, late tackles, kind of off the ball incidences and so forth. Uh, and, uh, you know, watching from the stand, it, it, it was a little bit frustrating because it kind of became uh, a little bit evident that, uh, you know, they, they were there to, to, to really show a physical presence and, and, and the focusing on the ball was sometimes not the priority. And, and that did come through to me uh, sitting on the, on the grandstand. And uh, when eventually I got pulled on the field, I was, I was already kind of a little bit frustrated by some of the incidences that, that happened on the field yeah. And Christian, I mean, you guys, it was obviously rattling the box there. I mean, it was working for you guys at that point. And, and how, how did you see it? Did you see it was going to spill over at any point? No, I mean, you know, the game, um, the game was over. I mean, they were, uh, when, the incident, when the big incident happened, the big fight. Um, and, yeah, I, I, there was no, as I said earlier, you know, there was no intent to go out. But it was a big, it was a big night for the Canadians. It was, a, it was a great opportunity for, for them to, sh to show themselves as, you know, great rugby players number one, and you know, maybe they also wanted to be show themselves as you know hard men, uh, you know. So and they are, are hard guys. Remember that most of them come come out of ice hockey, where fighting is actually part of the sport. So Rod Snow, for example, was a goon. So the goon in 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 in, in ice hockey is the guy that they send on to fight. And when the two goons fight against each other, the refs leave them, the teams part, and it's actually part of the sport of ice hockey. So they, I suppose there's, there's that mentality that, um, you know, exists within any Canadian rugby player. So, but no, again, to reiterate, I mean, there was no, there was no, there was, there was, there was, there was no, there was no intent. Um, planned and, intent. Um, there was no planned intent, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, Just fair watching the, watching the watching the the incident again earlier on, and at the time when I was there, I remember wondering why it was bullet that was singled out, and having watched it again tonight, uh, I thought of again, and I wasn't necessarily James Dalton's biggest fan back then, but I remember thinking at the time, why him? Um, you guys were on the field. I mean, it, I just felt, okay, I mean, there were two Canadians sent off as well, but to me, it looked as if like, they, they were sort of the instigators. I mean, what, why, why was it bullets? I mean, what did you, what did you guys feel when, out on the field? Can I jump in first? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, well, I, I don't know when the rule changed, but the rule at some stage changed to the third man who entered the fray. That's he was the chap that was penalised, and that was a brilliant ruling. And I don't think that ruling was around. And the third guy in this instant, instance was so obviously Scott Stewart. So, so Peter Henricks and, and, and um, our wing, yeah, Winston, Scott Winston. Uh, Winston, Winston Stanley, sorry. Winston Stanley, Stanley, yeah. um, you know, that had a little bit of argy-bargy and it was about to end. And Scott Stewart came in, A, from behind, B, high, and put his elbow into the back of Peter Henricks. I mean, that was insanity. Now, Scotty Stewart's a lovely guy. Fantastic chap. I think he's coaching somewhere in America now. I think he was at UCLA last. But a lovely chap that just did something absolutely crazy. And he was the chap that should have been sent off. There's no question about it. Um, I watched it again earlier as well. And James Dalton then came in. He was the fourth man in. Fourth man, okay. Uh, he was... 
Okay. He was, the, he was, was there ever any sanction? Sorry, I, I'm going to let Tenny he, he talk now. But was there any, ever any sanction against Scott Stewart? I can't remember. I know Peter Hendricks was, was sanctioned. Uh, after, you know, and, and, and yeah. quite frankly, the World Cup was over yeah. for Canada. You know? so if there was yeah. a sanction, he might have missed out on two club games yeah. uh, you know, back in Canada. I was going to j- jump in here because, I mean, Andy, I saw you throw probably the only punch I saw you throw in your career in that game as well. You had one or two uh, little right hooks there. Yeah, look, it's just totally out of character. And as you said, there was one or two incidents that had me a little bit uh, raveled up. I, I just collected an injury against Northern Transvaal late in the 80s. Uh, completely off the ball type of incident, which you know has caused me quite a lot of pain, and I still have that pain. And so, things off the ball, totally unnecessary, is 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 always something that gets my guile going a little bit. And uh, it was just one of those things, you know. The, um, it was, you know, the intent was clear. Um, you know, there was a little the raffle had kind of calmed down to some degree. And all of a sudden, there was a very obvious uh, want to try and come in at pace and uh, get involved. And uh, they were kind of beeline right right past me. And I think the fullback uh, walked into uh, a left little left of uh, of mine, which I'm not too proud of. <laughs> Is it a good punch? <laughs> it was a left Christian, so I'm not left, proud of it. Right? <laughs> you had a better right, if I recall. <laughs> yeah, just by the way, I, you know where I was during that fight? I was, I was back, in, back in the middle of the field chatting to Brendan Venter. And our conversation <laughs> while the fight was going on was about what we were going to do after the World Cup. You know, I would say like, yeah, so what are, you, what are your plans? You know, kind of, kind of making conversation. It was a bit awkward. They're actually killing each other 15 meters away. But um, yeah, so I wasn't involved. I wasn't much of a fighter. <laughs> Any, well, the, well, for me, that night was a, a very long one because the journalist had to sit at um, the old Buddha Erasmus until about one in the morning, maybe it was two in the morning, waiting for Edward Griffiths to come back with the... Uh, with with the sort of news on what was going to happen, whether there was going to be a sanction and, and what w- w- when when it was going to happen. Um, what was it like for you guys? Because you guys must have gone straight back to the hotel like you normally do. Um, was there a feeling that James was a bit unlucky as well? And I mean, obviously, Peter then got got sanctioned later later in the tournament. Uh, was there sort of a feeling that there could actually be more more of a sort of repercussion from from that game than? Than there is for a normal game. I'm remembering, of course, that it's the World Cup and that you guys had a had a quarterfinal still to play. Yeah, look, I mean, I'm still kind of struggling, in, and I understand, you know, if you're the third, fourth, fifth person and you you come in with with intent when you'd completely be not been involved, and that was the incident really when the fullback, you know, came in. He wasn't involved. He came from right. 20 meters back and, and wanted to throw a haymaker and came past me. He was, you know, aligning someone else up and he was next to me and I wasn't going to kind of allow it to happen. But, and the rest just was just adrenaline. So, um, but, you know, from, from that perspective, you know, James really, if you go and look at what he did, I think he got the rawest deal out of out of everyone, and uh, he was really unlucky because in normal uh, coast of things, you know, he, he would hardly have got a, a yellow card. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I think it was really really tough and hard on him, and and I know that it it, it, it hit him quite hard uh, after that as well. There's, there's yeah, a, there was a feeling. Like to, there was definitely yeah. a feeling of, of a level of unfairness in terms of how, the the, um, how that was meted out, um, and uh, yeah, so, so that, that wasn't wasn't great at all. Chris, you were going to say something. 
Yeah, and, and I would agree entirely with um, with Henny that um, James was extremely unfortunate, and um, you have to miss out on a World Cup is nothing short of, you know, I mean, incredibly disappointing would be an understatement. I mean, it's quite tragic that he would, you know, in a in a in a, a game against a minnows, a game that was already won, um, where he actually did very little apart from coming in, you know, he could argue that he was coming in to protect his player after the Scott Stewart had come, you know, charging in as the third player. I mean, the Scott Stewart, probably what should have happened in retrospect was that Scott Stewart should have got the red card and they should have left it to the sanction afterwards. They should have studied it all on video. But once the fracas had started, you know, uh, you know, then you, then you might as well, you know, you might as well give, you know, six red cards to each team because everybody who then gets involved and that's why the ruling was made that the instigator so in, in other words the ruling says that two people in a in a physical sport the likelihood that two people are going to get involved in an argy bargy is very good so what sparks it off the third person hence we we penalize the third person and that's what should have happened scott Stewart should have got the red card and um and if, you know, once, once you'd had a look at this on video and people had calmed down and put everything in perspective, put the tournament into perspective, perhaps they would have taken a different view on, on, um, on uh, James and, and Peter. Yeah, and, I, and I think, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that, Christian. And I think part of it, too, is, is you, you've rightly indicated, you know, you've got to take the tournament into consideration. Um, you know, when, when sides have their back against the wall, there's nothing really left to play. And you found it often in the EP sides, you know, club rugby, you know, there's nothing left to play for. So let's, let's just have a bit of a, uh, a punch in or two and, and, and show that, we, that we're up to you physically, you know. Uh, yeah. And I think when that happens, it, the game also needs to be adjudicated slightly differently because, you know, there was there was no initial intent, uh, you know, and and obviously if a side has got one or two stars and and they get drawn into this and those stars get red carded, you know, it has a massive impact uh, for the side, uh, you know, if there are another two three games to go in the tournament. Uh, Henny, just after the after the World Cup, I mean, there was huge ramifications for the box. I remember that um, some of your guys—I don't know if you were among them—disappeared to uh, Fish River Sun, if I remember correctly. For the first time, there was a little bit, from what we heard, there was a little bit of a sort of thing between Francois and, and Kitch, where um, Kitch was concerned about Francois's like m motivation. Still, with, you know, they, he thought that maybe. Um, the, 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 it was such a big blow to the to the Bok morale that that maybe it could derail your World Cup. Um, tell us a little bit about that time and um, what I've just mentioned about the trip to I think it was to Fish River Sun. I can't imagine there's no other casinos around yeah. there. So, um, you know how close how close was it to actually derailing your, your your World Cup campaign? The aftermath of 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 that Canadian game. Yeah, you know, you're right. We did we did end up going to the Fish River Sun and uh, spend spent a, a day or two there. Uh, you know, I think there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of confusion, and I think a lot of frustration because, you know, what subsequently came out of that was was exactly what we touched on earlier. You know, I, I, there was a sense in the side that a lot of what happened on the field was provocation, um, and and you know. If, if one had to go and analyze the video in, in detail, you know, there were a couple of incidents that raised their heads, which kind of, you know, you, you were almost forced to retaliate in some form or another. Um, and, and, and I think the fact that James, you know, got given the red card without really being involved in a incident that, that would justify it, was was really kind of demoralizing for the team in some way because we were a, a physical team we were a strong team we dominated the way we did um, but that was within the rules of the and the confines of the game 
uh, well, in most instances. <laughs> and so the reality was, um, you know, here we are trying to play to our strengths and, um, you know, losing players for it, uh, which was unjustified in our view. And, and there was a lot of discussion and a lot of, you know, un uncertainty and frustration, as I said, because it, 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 it you know, it, it, that uncertainty kind of said, well, where to now? You know, if we have to be careful about everything we do, then, I mean, you, you, you just limit your natural ability to come out with a flair and, and play. Um, so, so there was, there was an element of, of, I won't call it quite a derailment as such, but there was a lot of uncertainty and frustration um, amongst the players and even you know within admin circles and, and, and players questioning administrators for, for for not you know standing up for the players more and 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 and, and, and participating in in that role um, you know yeah uh, you know fortunately for for myself and I don't know I was told only later that the, the video clip where you know I got drawn into it was only shown after the cutoff period because I believe there was a cutoff period of, of, of 48 hours yeah. to submit your the evidence and I had the good Lord looking down on me I suppose <laughs> but <laughs> that that only surfaced on the Tuesday Wednesday so uh, they couldn't go back and reopen that and and um, uh, you know so I had a probably an easy bypass uh, where, where James, you know, had to, had to suffer some some of the consequences. Christian, maybe you come in just with what was a couple of days after that. Do you guys feel um, almost the, there was the feeling in the camp that it was almost you guys had done what you'd got set out to do, uh, even though you'd lost the game? Brendan, yeah, difficult because. You know, a World Cup ends quite um, abruptly. You know, you, you, you're out the tournament and everybody gets on a plan. And uh, I went back to Cape Town and the Canadians, most of them went back to Canada and then some of them were living in other parts of the world already at that stage, mm -hmm. playing rugby. So I would have literally spent that night with them. And uh, yeah, I was left to face the music here and everywhere I went and I'd still get uh, chirped about it. Um, yeah, so I I I I I wasn't part of uh, yeah I wasn't part of. I don't think I don't think for 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 one minute the Canadians were proud of what 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 had happened that night. And mm. um, I certainly don't think that. And I think that as time has gone by, I think that um, I can't speak on behalf of 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 them. But I mean, I would imagine that um, you know there would have been a bit of remorse about what what transpired and. And um, people have got to take responsibility. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I still today when I bump into James, I don't. I've never seen Peter again. But I mean, I still feel bad that he was, you know, sent off and I was involved in the game, and he missed out on playing in a World Cup final. Um, of course, the upside of all of this, if there is any upside, was that uh, Chester Williams came back into the squad, and mm. what that meant for South Africa. Yeah, no, definitely. Henry, I was going to ask you, just when you guys had to say farewell to James and Peter, how did that go? I mean, was there an official farewell or did they just leave the hotel without everybody knowing? Or Yeah, look, I mean, there, 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 there was an announcement to say that, uh, you know, that they'd kind of... Been been banned out of the rest of the tournament as a result of the footage and and discussions and and, and the adjudication which took place um, and um, yeah I think there was there was to some degree you know on on both sides them leaving and and us being kind of left to carry on there was a certain level of disenchantment and, and unhappiness about how everything unfolded um, oh. at that time. Uh, but, you know, your focus needs to shift quickly. Uh, you've got limited time and, 
and uh, as sad as what it is to see them go, we we had to you know get our focus back on 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 uh, you know the next game, and uh, you know that's that's what the administration and, and the coaches and the management you know try to. When you say to that there was, you said earlier that there was like a bit of resentment at officials. Um, I remember I interviewed James at some point, James Dalton, for, for, for a book I did. And he told me that he felt that he wasn't defended enough in the, and that Mornay, because we all know Mornay, Mornay's a great statesman. And Mornay's whole thing was like, let rugby be the winner. And I think James was offered a, a lawyer by Louis Late, and it was refused in the end because we're rugby people and we'll fight this on a rugby, on a rugby basis, which I can imagine in those days might still have been like the spirit that, that, that people took, took on board. But of course, rugby was about to change and become professional. And these days you look back and you think, jeepers, the guy never had a lawyer there. That just seems ridiculous. I mean, was that sort of like, you know, incredulity sort of shared by the players that like maybe there should have been more of a defense made, and certainly in James's case. Yeah, well, you, you you mentioned about professionality and so forth, and and uh, I do think there was an element from James that he was kind of left out high and dry, um, and 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 that things could have been handled, you know, differently and, and more of a you know defence put up, and I think you know in the modern day in the modern era that would be a very justifiable position. Uh, but the sentiment that you've highlighted was was one that at, at the time, you know, seemed to be part of the amateur game, and uh, it it was what management decided to follow. Um, you know, sadly for James, it it it, uh, it didn't have the desired effect. Uh, you know, hoping that someone will be be retained. Uh, because of rugby, I think would have been, you know, fair, and we've discussed it now at length. But that would have been the right thing to keep him as part of the, the team and, and and find some other form of sanction. But that wasn't the case, and and I think that's what left James very disenchanted with with the situation and how it unfolded. Mm -hmm. Well, I think. I I think we've probably wrapped it up. I don't think we can say too much more about the game, Gav. I don't know if you, you've got any final no, thoughts. I, just I think we've done it. <laughs> to death. I just thought maybe, maybe we can start with Christian, just where you are, where you are now. And um, you know, when you look back at that game, thinking it's 25 years, um, just your thoughts that it's been 20, a quarter of a century already. And uh, yeah, what you're doing now with your life. Yeah, I just, um, my mom lives with me and I just said to, to my mom, I just said, geez, can you believe it's 25 years since, um, since that, uh, that night? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm still living in Cape Town and um, I, sh I, I, I never lived in Canada. People sometimes think I actually lived again. I was born in Canada. I think we came back here too. My mom's Canadian. So I've lived in South Africa all my life. Um, and but in 91, I did go and live in Vancouver for a year, which is a great city. And um, yeah, so I've, I've lived in, I came back to Cape Town. I've lived in Canada. I'm sorry, lived in Cape Town um, since then. Um, I did a year in rugby league, Sydney. That was interesting. I think Henny also got offered. I think everybody got offered. And, and the World Cup Springboks all obviously stayed. And uh, those guys who were on the periphery, a lot of them like Tion Strauss and... Um, uh, Heinrich Fuls and Peter Miller, we all went over and played uh, a season of rugby league. Andy Marinos, Andrew Aitken. Anyway, so <laughs> moving on, I'm waffling. Um, so I've been in the property business in um, various uh, different roles. And currently I'm uh, just finished off with a residential development. Um, and uh, I'm involved in commercial industrial property. Okay. And Henny, uh, you down in down in the Eastern Cape there, you're on your, your, the game farm there. Tell us a bit more what you're doing at the moment. Uh, Brendan, yeah, I'm really most of the time up in Johannesburg involved in, in uh, a number of ventures. The one is just an online au auctioning company looking at assets from, you know, mining and industrial assets. We kind of move those for, for large corporates. Uh, as well as, you know, just being... Uh, 
you know, applying solutions in terms of cost saving, like this unique lighting savings for big warehouses, saving them between 30 and 90% of their lighting bills. So there, there are a lot of those types of options. So Christian, maybe you and I can have a chat after this. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, so um, other than that, yeah, I've got the little game farm down uh, down here between Grahamstown and Kenton on Sea. And, uh, yeah, just love nature, love being, you know, in it and uh, spending time down here. It's just a lot more relaxing than Joburg. So I need to get down here every now and then. <laughs> I can believe that. Now, listen, guys, thanks for the, for the chat. I mean, it's been great reminiscing. I promise you we won't be phoning you in 25 years' time in the future. I don't think <laughs> we'll all be around by then, but uh, hopefully. But uh, well, there'll be something else taking up our time by that stage. But thanks for the chat. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, it was really great catching up with you guys. Yeah. Just, I, I just wanted to say that, like, if you can have both of you guys again at some point, uh, possibly yeah. in daylight hours as well. Um, doing it just to look back at your careers. We've done it with a few guys. Mark Andrews um, was, was, was with, with us for quite a while. And it's actually quite interesting just to go back into your careers and, and, and look at that. So at some stage, if, if you guys are willing, like in, in the future, um, we'll revisit it. And as I say, we'll, this is the first time we've done this thing under, <laughs> under lights, as it were. So it's like um, maybe, maybe it will be better to, to either get this fixed up or otherwise do it in the... Mm. In the daylight. I look better in the dark, so I'm happy tonight. <laughs> <laughs>